podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. With Vanguard advice, no matter what your retirement goals are, they can help you get there and enjoy it for years to come. The financial journey is all yours, but you never have to take it alone. That's the value of ownership. Visit Vanguard.com and explore Vanguard advice. All investing is subject to risk. Fund shareholders own the funds that own Vanguard. Services are provided by Vanguard Advisors, Inc., a registered investment advisor. Welcome back to another Love Tennis podcast with me, James Gray of inews.co.uk and the iNewspaper. I've got George Belshaw, the famed tennis writer. I'm going to use a different adjective for you every week, George. It's going to get worse, I assure you. And Calvin Betton, only ever the respected tennis coach. Uh, We've got loads to talk about, as usual, all over the tennis world and possibly one of the most varied running orders I've ever put together, although given that George usually does it, that is quite a low bar. Um, We're going to talk about Daria Kasatkina, who's made a pretty big revelation over the last 24 hours or so. Leighton Hewitt uh, is into the Hall of Fame. Maxime Cressy was also into our Hall of Fame because he won the Hall of Fame. Uh, Calvin's got a special theory. More on that as we get it. Uh, Serena Williams is going to play in Toronto. uh, And we're also going to talk about tennis umpires on the back of a brilliant long read from William Ralston, which, well, if you haven't read it, feel free to pause and go and read it or listen to the podcast of it. But make sure you come back because we're going to talk about it as well. Um, But I wanted to start with some pretty big news breaking in the tennis world um, pretty much in the last 24 hours, as far as I can tell. Um, Daria Kasatkina um, has been talking over the last, uh, yeah, as far as I can tell, 24 hours. She's, of course, uh, Russia's top-ranked female number one at the moment. She got to the semi-finals of the French Open. Uh, She's also a two-time previous Grand Slam quarter-finalist. Um, And she has been talking over the last uh, few hours about her life, uh, sexuality and various other things. Um, She's she was doing an interview with uh, a Russian blogger who I've not come across before called Vitya Kravchenko. um, And she said some she said talking about Nadia Karpova, um, saying my respects to Nadia Karpova for coming out at a girl. I was happy for her, but also other people, especially girls, who needed to know that it has empowered them for sure, supported them. Not only did Nadia help herself by coming out and get this burden off her chest, she has also helped others. Um, Kravchenko said, have you got a girlfriend? If if she was in a relationship with a woman at the moment, she said, yes, uh, living in the closet is impossible, not for the long run. It's too hard, it's pointless, and you'll be completely focused on that until you choose to come out. Of course, it is up to you how you decide to do it and how much you tell Living in peace with yourself is the only thing that matters, and F everyone else. Um, George, uh, I'm kind of been suggested to me that she may have talked about her sexuality in public before, or at least previously having relationships with girls, but uh, it doesn't feel like something that I've ever known about Daria Kazakina. Not that it massively matters, but she has spoken about it much more openly in this interview, and that's significant because she's Russian, if you want to expand on that. Yeah, so I think she's basically spoken quite openly about how um, difficult it is coming from Russia, where um, she says you know, it's not a very open kind of society towards um, LGBTQIA plus people. Um, there's been some comments from kind of Russian politician since this uh kind of calling her a bad role model Mm. um and talking about kind of traditional cultural moral values that are more uh aligned with the russian way of life i suppose is how they he would frame it um yeah i mean it's always it's always difficult you know i think sometimes we we take for granted a little bit kind of the open nature of our society even though it's it's far from perfect here there are you know some countries where it is incredibly difficult to come out and it you know and then that's not saying it is straightforward here because you know we we know as our media we celebrate any sports person who comes out because 
there's obviously a higher percentage of that and in sport it's always been i guess a large stigma around it wrongly um so yeah it's it's always good when players break rank maybe it seems a bit of an odd thing to say but you know actually are able to be themselves and i think mm. there's a nice quote from her at the end where she says living with living in peace with yourself is the only thing that matters and fuck everyone else which is quite a nice sentiment really and a sentiment we can all get behind although i really wish you hadn't said the full f word george because now i'm gonna have to put the explicit label on the podcast you can put a Honestly. beef over it can't you <laughs> oh yeah no create more edit work for me george because if you don't create enough as it is <laughs> or, or maybe like a grunt <laughs> um calvin it's interesting george talking about like different ways of life all over the world and I, I think that what that Russian politician is saying and what I think are large parts of Russia, there is plenty of homophobia. I remember watching lots of documentaries in the run-up to the 2018 World Cup and I appreciate the football hooligans don't stand for everyone, but like lots of homophobia on the terraces in Russia and um, there clearly is a political movement driven by the president that is pretty homophobic, among other things, obviously. Um, but, you know, tennis is a sport where there is some open homosexuality, which, let's face it, compared to most sports, is actually quite a lot. Um, I wonder what it's like travelling around the world, you know, is a touring sport, and you must have to dip in and out of countries where certain things aren't necessarily legal or aren't necessarily accepted. It, it must make life hard for for players who, you know, players who are gay for example or, or maybe who travel with a partner or something like that there must be parts of the world they basically don't go to um i'd imagine so yeah um i'm trying to think i haven't certainly not recently i haven't been to any of those places hmm. um i guess most of my travel over the last few years has just been in europe and tunisia hmm. um which i think it's fine there although i don't know it's a muslim country isn't it so Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, well, I was just thinking that as well. I'm not really sure, but I suppose it's one of the things where you wish, like, you wish that tennis, and I always think of tennis as being like relatively open when it comes to things like LGBTQ plus. But then, like, Margaret Court turns up, and everyone just acts like she's fine, and it's not a big deal. There was a there was a good report, um, a guy called Charlie Eccleshare did when he worked for the Telegraph a few years ago, um, where he kind of went around and interviewed a lot of players around um, their views on kind of same sex relationships and stuff, and that uh, that was pretty eye opening. I can't remember certain players' names, but they were actually kind of like, yeah, I don't think it's right quite openly. Um, and a big thing in that report actually was how that while tennis is kind of, you have more public um, same sex players in tennis, they're more often than not in the women's side of the game. Mm. I don't think at that stage there was a single openly gay man. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I know obviously Kazakhstan is not a man, so I suppose it fits in that side, but it, it, it's not as clear a blanket as it's a really open sport in tennis, if you know. I mean, it's. It, it, there's been a lot of, you know, you had Van Oytvank famously kissing Greek Minnan at Wimbledon. That was seen as quite a big mm. landmark moment in tennis. Um, you've had Casey Delacqua, um, who has obviously been the victim of some vitriol from Margaret Court in the past. Mm. Um, but it, it, it hasn't necessarily... Billie Jean King, of course, mm. back in the day, they're kind of older. It's always been a pretty pioneer sport, but there's still a very long way to go. And you know, at the end of the day, people like Kasatkina coming out um, in societies that where this there is more kind of oppression um, mm. can only help the cause and kind of let people see. You know, you shouldn't. It shouldn't even be. I hate the phrase. They're really brave to come out because it shouldn't. You should never necessarily need to be brave to <laughs> be yourself. It feels so weird to kind of say that, but it is a lot of bravery. But you know, people. I think it's valid. To, awful people. I think it's valid to call it brave. I mean, I appreciate that it's just part of someone's life, but yeah. you know, you should, they, you they know want what it to be brave. I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, that's more. It, it, yeah, it shouldn't I necessarily understand. be viewed as a great act of bravery because <laughs> you should be able to just be yourself. But with the context around you and around Kasatkina, it, it is incredibly brave. I mean, without wanting to sort of make this an indexing process of of you know 
players with different sexualities from the norm. Um, but I mean, are there any openly gay male tennis players on tour at the moment? I, off the top of my head, I can't think that there has been anyone who's come out. But you know, statistically, there definitely are some people. And you know, we had the first footballer in the UK um, in the top four leagues come out since since Fashionu, um, which people, some people may not know the story of, but it was thirty odd years ago and more. Um, and I urge you to read about it, but. You know the barriers are very slowly breaking down. I can't think of anyone in the male in the men's game. I don't. Has there ever been? Well, that's what I was wondering. I mean, I was going to come uh, to our ancient history. John Michael Gambill came out after his career, right? Yeah, that was that was quite well known while he was playing. I mean, it mm. was. I don't know if he officially ever said it, but it was quite open. Yeah. Around circles, and also similar with. Um, there's a Moroccan player called Hikam Aradzi, who um, who was the same. I see, but then it's often like that, isn't it? You know, within industries or sport. I remember, for example, when is it Tim Cook, who used to be a CEO, may still be the CEO of Apple, and I mean, it was actually pretty unfortunate because he got outed on live TV. It was like a panel debate on maybe Bloomberg or something like that. And they were talking about, you know, the lack of openly gay executives in the um, NASDAQ or whatever it was. And someone said, oh, you know, well, I think we're all pretty aware that, you know, Tim Cook at Apple, you know, is, is, is one of those. And two of the other people on the panel are just shaking their head going, no, 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 people don't know that. But, you know, it's often like that within kind of these, these small, tight knit communities. Yeah, people I mean, I'm, not... um, I'm sorry, James, I've been reading a book about the Golden State Warriors and their mm. general manager is openly gay as well, which was quite at the time when he when they announced him in I think about 2014, maybe. Mm. It was quite a big step, mm. but doesn't really get spoken about now. And that <laughs> general manager in basketball is maybe the most important position in the club. Yeah. I mean, it's good, isn't it? I, I feel like what's been quite nice, and actually the lad at Blackpool, whose name I can't even remember, the guy, the lad who came out in league, to, as the first fo- league footballer to come out in 30 years, I kind of can't remember his name. And I, I sort of like that. Like, I sort of thought that this media circus might be created around him and, you know, he'd be getting rung up for quotes on every LGBT plus issue that anyone could possibly think of. But... I think it's actually been quite refreshing that he came out, he did a big interview, he said, this is me, I'm ready for whatever the world's got to throw at me. And then now he's just a League 2 footballer again. And I, I've actually found that quite refreshing. And, and hopefully, I mean, you know, I think, as I say, Derek Asakina has talked a little bit about this kind of stuff before, but this is maybe what she said, it was the most open she's ever been about it on film or, or publicly. So hopefully she can just crack on with her life and, well, she'll be back playing Grand Slam tennis quite soon, which would be great. Um, but uh, hopefully that's still the case. The other thing she said, which was really significant, and I was very surprised to hear, is during this blog she was asked, um, I think it, I think the question was something like, what do you want right now? And she was hitting, and just be- between hitting balls, she just said, for the war to end. Um, now, people might not know that in Russia they don't call the invasion of Ukraine a war, it is religiously referred to in the press, which is all state controlled pretty much, um, as a special military operation, a sort of euphemism to make it sound like they're not waging a war and committing war crimes and breaking the Geneva Convention on a regular basis, but to make it more sound like they're just restoring their borders and you know just doing exercises. It's not the case, of course. But um, it's pretty significant. I mean, Calvin, we, we've talked a lot about this in the context of, of banning Russian players. It, it's. I was pretty surprised to hear her come out and use those words and say it in that way. Yeah, I, I think all the Russian players are of the same mind as well. Mm. Certainly that's the the vibe I get from other players who have spoken to Russian players about it. Um, yeah, very brave of her to, to come out and say it. Mm. Um, and I wonder whether that'll open the floodgates and a few more will, will do so. But also I wouldn't expect them to because we know the repercussions of what that might lead to. Yeah. You do wonder whether they might think there's safety in numbers now, you know, and, you know, they can't come for all of us kind of thing. But, I mean, without wanting to be too kind of morbid about it, they absolutely can. I mean, you know, this is this is a, a regime that will stop at nothing. I, you know, don't yeah. even want to tempt fate. I guess like, maybe Kasatkina thought she'd 
go, you know, she'd go all in. She thought <laughs> she'd already done. What, you know, maybe they both go home. Each other. Yeah, they're not going to like it. me already. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe she's given up on going back to Russia at any point. I don't know. I don't know. Best of luck to her, and and well played. You know, most of all, uh, and I look forward to seeing her back back on the tennis court at a Grand Slam after she missed out um, on Wimbledon, of course. Let's move on to more tennessy issues and slightly lighter things. Um, the lightest of all, because I think the Tennis Hall of Fame is a bit of nonsense, but some people think it's very important. Uh, and Leighton Hewitt, I think, thinks it's particularly important. He was inducted on Saturday evening into the International Hall of Fame. Uh, he said, The Hall of Fame seemed like something that was so far away from me ever being part of. It was never something I thought about as a player, obviously, because no one did, because no one cares. Uh, no, I'm joking. It was always, I thought, for the people that were my idols growing up and the absolute legends of the sport. Um, he talked, it was a pretty moving speech, actually. I watched back the, the video on, you can find it on YouTube. I'll try and put it in the, the show notes. Uh, and he talked about the, the two famous lines from the Kipling poem, If, which are, of course, written on the walkway uh, above Centre Court, on the way to Centre Court um, at Wimbledon. It's if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. Um, and I think, well, I don't know whether Leighton Hewitt necessarily did that throughout his career, Calvin, but I certainly think of the latter stages of his career, which went on for quite a long time, as I recall. He certainly didn't seem to go away, put it that way. Uh, yeah, he had a strange career, actually, um, where he was... He came on the scene young. I was actually in Australia when he played his first professional tournament, and I think mm. he beat Agassi. That would have been the, the winter of our winter in 1998. Yep. Uh, um, and word got around that there was this, obviously, there were, we didn't have social media and things like that back then, but word got around that there was this 16-year-old who'd beaten Andre Agassi, who was at then in his prime, really. Um, and... Um, and then he, he he rose pretty quick and was entirely dominant for about eighteen months, hmm. um, and then it just ended. And then he he wasn't remotely dominant at all. And he came through in a period of time which wasn't a particularly strong time for men's tennis. Um, there was no re no no one else was really at their best. Um, it was pre Federer, and then Federer came and. Yeah, he, he sort of market corrected him really, and then from then on, he was not very good at all. It was strange, fast, rose fast, completely dominant, and then I say not very good at all. You know, he was a solid top top fifteen player. Yeah, it's funny. Funny you mentioned Federer there because I think it's really hard to like look at Hewitt's career separately from Federer's in many ways. Like you think we're talking about kind of generations between Djokovic and. Federer. I mean, Hewitt's a year older than Federer, I think I'm right in saying. Like, they're yeah. really, really, really close in age. And I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying that Hewitt dominated their early meetings, like won something of the first, like, seven of nine or something, or seven of ten. And then it finished something like Federer winning 16 of the last 18. But it, I just find it really interesting. You have these guys kind of coming up together, Hewitt clearly coming up as this super-duper player as a young kid, and then just almost completely fades away as this other bloke completely starts taking that. I, I, I don't know, Calvin, no, I was quite young, I suppose, when they were first coming up, so maybe I don't have a great picture of it that well, but can you, can you talk a little bit to that and how that sort of happens, how players develop so differently? Well, Federer was always renowned as, an, as a top, maybe one of the best juniors ever, and Hewitt kind of skipped juniors, mm. and that was the thing. He was, and I guess... Players often peak it. There's no, there's no pathway. There's no blueprint to the top of tennis. And and Hewitt came through very early while Federer was still finding his game. Really, I suppose. And um, and what changes in a rivalry like that where you have someone just winning? Like is it seven, seven out of nine, seven out of ten is not a bad. You know, that's not necessarily a small sample size. Like that's a decent chunk of matches for guys kind of the same age. Yeah, I think it's more that that you know, Fed, you've you find your game you find you know you have to learn and develop and players people just develop at different paces at different speeds you know and like i guess nadal's trajectory was similar to uh hewitt's on the way up it just lasted about an extra 15 years <laughs> and and he played the thing is with hewitt the way that he played he, he he just there wasn't anything complicated in what he did he just made a lot of balls he was very fast around the court and he made a lot of balls but it was strange how 
dominant he was on because back then grass courts were fast mm. and he won Wimbledon and he won the US Open so you know, the, the 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 difference in court speeds were was big back then mm. um but yeah he just never um it just seemed like a, a whole lot of quality players who were similarly aged to him but you always thought him a little bit older um came through and just started beating him like Roddick Murray when Murray came on the scene and Murray just that was a big one I think with as well as Federer when Murray came on the scene because Murray basically played a similar game style to Hewitt and was just way better at it it's funny you mentioned Murray because I was just having a quick look at Hewitt's Wikipedia page and there's there was a line about uh Tim Henman Pat McEnroe Jim Courier all describing Hewitt's lob as the best in the world. And then there's a slight line later saying, Henman later said that Murray had succeeded him. As the yeah. <laughs> don't know about the lob world rankings. You know, <laughs> That's one for another time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it was, um, and I think I'm right in saying that Murray beat Hewitt in the final of his first ever tournament win. That sounds about right. It was the final of San Jose, San Jose. in 2006. Yeah. Another good quote from a pretty good source. Agassi, his book, The Open, describes Hewitt as one of the best shot selectors in the history of men's tennis. Best okay. shot selectors. Okay. I'm not I mean, sure he didn't have many shots to select. So that's <laughs> like, like, cross court forehand and cross court backhand. Like, that's... <laughs> um... uh, incidentally, just you mentioned he won Wimbledon Calvin, which of course is what a lot of UK listeners will remember him for. I was just looking at that Wimbledon run. I mean, he did, okay, he didn't beat many top 10 players. He beat one top 10 player, specifically, Tim Henman. But in terms of guys who could play on grass, I feel like, you know, he only dropped two sets in the entire tournament. And they were both to, and I'm going to mispronounce this, Sheng Shalkin, uh, who I know very little about, I have to say. Um, but, you know, he beat Henman in the semis, he beat Narbandian in the final, he lost six games in the final to Narbandian. I mean, you know, there's not to be said. That was at. a strange one, that that, that whole tournament was strange, because I think there was something in the semi where Xavier Melis, who, again, was seen at the time as being a player who was really going to come and go to the top of the game, was in the, he was up in the final, up in the semi, up in the the semi-final against Nalbandian hmm. and it, no, no one ever really got to the bottom of it he just seemed to I guess now it might be that he had a panic attack or something hmm. we see it as then but it was back then it was a combination of fatigue and choking and Nalbandian really shouldn't have been in the final um, well he he had played two five setters he beat Melis beat Rosetsky in five sets in the fourth and then he beat Krychek 9-7 in the yeah. quarterfinals in the fifth set and then, yeah, Nabanian got a two-set lead, and then Melise pulled it back to he beat, won the third and fourth six one six two, and then went to pieces in the final set. But yeah, but there was a big. I, I seem to remember there was a huge pause in the middle of it, and right. I remember watching, it and no one really knew what why we were paused, um, mm. and it was it was just a strange vibe that. But yeah, it's around about that period of Wimbledon where you had random finalists and winners. Mm. Um, you just don't you. Know, the, the halcyon days, I guess. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I was just going to say. I mean, you, you basically just Hewitt's like a footnote, isn't he, between Sampras's era of domination at Wimbledon onto Federer's. I mean, since Hewitt's won it, no one outside Federer, Djokovic, Nadal, and Murray's won it, which is kind of crazy yeah. considering that was twenty years ago. <laughs> I see you've been listening to Nick Kyrgios's press conferences, George. He goes on about this a lot. Love He's been it. saying. He's been saying a lot how since I was born, only four guys have won this tournament, which, you know. It's not is. quite true, is it? That's not true. He was born in 96. He's similar age to me, isn't he? Oh, no, yeah, he's a bit younger than me. Or maybe he didn't say four. I can't remember. I, I, I'm sure he got it right because he kept saying it a lot, and I feel like Rothenberg would have called Probably him Probably only about point. seven or eight. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not a lot, is it? Let's face it. Um, anyway, Leighton Hewitt into the Hall of Fame uh, as is traditional. They induct someone at the Hall of Fame Open in Newport. Maybe one day they will induct Maxime Cressy, who I won the title. Calvin Bettel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's it's equally possible, I would suggest. Don't know if I'm eligible yet. <laughs> <laughs> You're not old enough. Yeah, of course. Yeah. How could you possibly be? 
Um, Maxime Cressy beat Alexander Bublik in the final in uh, three sets. There was a slightly worrying slip at one point, but uh, he came through. Bublik basically called him lucky afterwards, which seemed a bit harsh. Um, it, John Isner then came out on Twitter and sort of defended him, him, defended him, and said he sort of, you know, you make your own luck in tennis, and you know, uh, Max especially, you know, he rolls the dice. Or I don't, I don't even think he was as kind of magnanimous as that. To be honest, I think he was purely against public. Here you go, you make your own luck. Max plays a game that makes opponents extremely uncomfortable. Congrats to him on his first title. And in a minute, Calvin's going to tell us why Maxime Cressy makes everyone quite so uncomfortable. Cox Panoramic Wi-Fi includes advanced security to help protect all your connected devices. You'll get real-time alerts. Oh, like this one. So you don't have to worry about malware. Or when your kid downloads a song from a shady link. And now all your computer can play is... Red color, red color, where are you? All blocked, thanks to advanced security, included with Cox Panoramic Wi-Fi. Advanced security must be enabled in the Panoramic Wi-Fi app. Restrictions apply. It used to be hard to find the exact auto parts you needed. And that meant spending a lot of time at swap meets. It's a different game now, when you can order exactly what you need from eBay Motors. They have 122 million parts, so you can always find the right fitment. Spend less time searching and more time building with the eBay Motors app, or visit ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. You're listening to the Love Tennis Podcast with me, James Gray of inews.co.uk and the iNewspaper, George Belshaw and Calvin Beton, who, I'm told, has a theory uh, I was talking before the break about Maxime Cressy and how he has won the title in Newport, the last grass court title of the season, beating Alexander Bublik in the final. Um, Calvin, serve and volley tennis is something that we have talked about before in this segment that we call Minute Tennis. But since you've got a theory about it, I thought we'd devote this week's Minute Tennis to Calvin's conspiracy theory. Tennis fans, Dan, your, don your tin foil hats. Calvin's got some it's, truth for you. I'm quite excited for this because neither of us have any idea what this theory is. So we no. might need to totally edit the whole thing out when it's completely <laughs> mental or something. Calvin, the stage is yours. The mainstream media are allowing you in. I was thinking about this idea of why there aren't many serve volleyers in the game anymore. And then this, this sort of theory that comes around that, that we'll get, it will start to find its way back in with players serve volleying some of the time or 50% of the time or something. But I find that, I was thinking last week, I find that difficult to see because for one specific reason, that back in the 80s and 90s, when players serve volleyed, the movement into the net is part of the technique. If you think about the service techniques of Edberg, Becker, um, Sampras, Stick, they, 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 they move into the court with the serve. Whereas players nowadays, they don't so much do that. So it would, the last maybe the last 10 percent of the service technique would be required to change for them to serve a lot and i noticed this last week when i was looking at players who try and serve volley and most of the time when players try and serve volley now they 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 miss the first serve and that is exactly a minute from calvin Beton. um do, do, george you, ha- you always have further questions and we allow them what are your further questions um, so I'm going to pick up on a little part of the end of, that you were talking about there, the kind of change of the final part of the service motion and kind of not following through. Do you think that kind of uh, uh, following through maybe sounds <laughs> a little bit dodgy, but, that, you know, that kind of coming in behind it, um, do you think that has affected serve speeds positively in the modern day and the fact that they can get more power because they're not then thinking about going to the net after? I don't necessarily think so, no. And I, I was just trying to say before my time ran out, I think it's a case that it affects the service technique in a bad way because you notice players who are try- they're trying to slightly change their technique in order to get in and therefore they, miss, they, therefore they miss their serve more than they would want to. And I don't know if there's a way around that, which makes me think that bar the odd mix-up of a serve and volley, I don't think we'll find anybody serving volleying like 50% of the time because it would basically require them to have two almost different serving techniques to be Apart able to call Cressy, them. of course. Yeah, but <laughs> Cressy serving volleys most of the time. Hmm. 
If so it, it's oh, so fine. you're talking there's about the, like kind of the mix between. Yeah, the two, there's right, no right. reason why. If, you know, I don't think we'll see it, but you could get a player like Cressy, who obviously we do, who comes in because it's part. That is his service technique. The last part of his service technique takes him into the court more. Whereas if you get a player who's who is plays more from the baseline, they can't do that. If you watch McEnroe, and I'm actually going to see McEnroe's documentary tomorrow. His service motion it is part, going into the net is part of his service motion. You can't imagine McEnroe serving and staying back. It wouldn't it wouldn't look like it makes any sense. Which sorry, which type of serve is most conducive in the modern game to serve and volley? Are we talking about kind of a slower, spinnier kick serve to give yourself more time to come in? Or is a big flat serve better what, what's the sort of serve that gives you the ball you'd want as a serve there's, there's no particular i mean there's no particular type there's basically two types you basically had sampras becker stick who just had big serves and they could more importantly the most important thing is hitting your spots on the serve you've got to hit your spot if you don't hit your spot then you get especially against these days you'll get cleaned out the other type of serve volley were edberg and rafter who had huge kick serves which gave them a little extra time to get into the net and they were difficult to return. You were, the, the returners were, t- were taking them above shoulder height. It's like, if only you mentioned kind of the, the pick and the spots point, because there's someone I think does serve and volley actually really well on demand, but not someone who does it all the time, is, is Nadal. And he can actually really pick his spots so well on the yeah. serve. We've spoken about his kind of, the best part of his volleying is almost the sensing of when to come in. But I've seen him do that in big moments quite a lot over the last couple of years bringing that into his game i mean is there anyone else you kind of think of who there's a different there the difference there though is and you you will see the occasional one of these where nadal is doing it expecting that his opponents won't think he'll serve volley so they're going to chip the return and he's going to he's wanting to get a high put away volley whereas people like rafter and edberg they almost they were accepting they're going to be playing first volley from their feet but they didn't bother them they knew they were so good at that volley so it's it's more of a Nadal's looking for more of a surprise tactic to give him a an easy first volley, and it's that that's entirely based on him not doing it very regularly. Yeah, if he yeah, was doing yeah. it regularly, then the play the returners would hit the return a bit more. It's always interesting watching Rafa serve volley because you're right, George. He does do it at big moments. I always think Love Forty is like in the same way that for, Kyrgios Forty Love Up, the first time it happens in a match is a guaranteed underarm serve. Nadal f- love 40 down early on in a set serve and volley a large percentage of the time it, I don't know what it is it's one of those patterns of play thing that you pick up when you watch enough tennis that it's something though I, I often like um, the, I used to do it when I played and I like it I, I, I encourage my players to a coach to do it is second serve serve and volley on a big point mm. because you've got to think of the returner's mindset it's the last thing they're going to expect um, and their mindset is big points, a break point for all in a set, 30, 40 for all. The thing that they're going to be thinking is, right, make the return. Don't miss the return. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a good time to do them. Whereas on a first serve, they might expect that you may do it. So they may be looking for it. But um, yeah. Well, Cressy is probably going to be seeded for the US Open on the back of this. I mean, depending on all sorts of things, including injuries and exactly how the rest of his summer goes, but he'll almost certainly be seeded for the US Open. That's obviously going to make his draw a little bit easier as well. Um, I mean, how far do we think he can go? You, you would think he would back himself on fast Flushing Meadows courts to beat anyone in the first two rounds. I mean, is is he is he genuinely a difficult player for... I mean, you'd expect the top eight to be him, but the guys from nine to twenty, you think they might have quite fancy the chances, no? I think I don't know. I think he's a really excellent player, and I've been impressed with the kind of substance behind his rise because I, I watched him at the US. What year was that? Must have been, it was the one of the pandemic ones, twenty twenty, possibly. He played Sissipas first round, um, and I, I was kind of aware of Cressy and knew he had a fun game style and I th- thought it'd be really interesting to see how he stacked. So he played, you know, played a really good match, lost, it was very entertaining. Um, but I thought at that point, this guy had a, had a ceiling really, realistically, in terms of how far he can go in a slam, how high he can go in the world. And he's, he's probably 
closing in on that ceiling for me. I think he could be a top 20 player, potentially, but not much higher. I but think he's, he, he's got, like... I mean, Calvin, I'm sure, will agree with this. He's got an absolutely elite serve. Yep. And he has a strategy that goes into that. John Isner has an elite serve and has been, like... Has Isner been top... But Isner's been top 10, yeah, hasn't he? Ace, I think, Isner, maybe. Hmm? Ace, possibly, I think. Yeah, I'm sure he's been at World Tour Finals at least once, so that yeah. would suggest that he's been up there. I mean, it, that would suggest that there is room for someone like him. Or is Cressy's serve not as effective as Isner's, Calvin? Eh... Uh... I mean, Murray says that Isner's got the best serve of all time. Mm. So, I'd, you know, he's faced it. I'd still say it's Sampras. <laughs> um, did Murray ever play Sampras? I can't imagine that he did. I don't think so. Sampras Just retired in 01. But, yeah. I mean, he probably watched him. I mean, yeah. For anyone who, I don't know, if many of our listeners, I guess, would remember Sampras. But the, when we're talking about hitting spots, there's definitely never been anybody better. Right. Um on first and second serve and he'd often hit first serve for a second serve mm. um and make it um so whether he would have as good a serve as isner uh you'd say maybe not quite this but... is cressy right yeah cressy yeah maybe not quite but you know I don't, how do you judge it like cressy mm. opelka isner they're all kind of much of a muchness aren't they yeah, and, and to be fair, I guess, you know, you've got Apelka kicking around at 15 in the world, so a big serve can t- can take you pretty far. And, and Cressy's got more about him than just that, to be fair. I mean, he, as you say, he's got a fun style that... But I I, I don't know, I, I'm just... he He's adamant he'll get to top 10, and he might well do. I, I love watching him, but I just feel like the game has slightly moved on, and I think mm. it can... The better returners will always beat him, really, is my Yeah, you get situations feel. like, you know, like Murray always used to play against Karlovic in his prime, and he'd just chew Karlovic up every time. Hmm. The, the best returners. And, and to be fair, Murray, who is one of the best, probably one of the best five returners of all time, um, his record against Kyrgios is phenomenal as well for the same reason. Hmm. Um, interestingly, I was reading something on the ATP website about kind of this uh, adjacent the other day about k- returners on grass um, and the best active players returners on grass. Now, Djokovic and Murray, unsurprisingly, are the top two. There's only one other player who has a percentage of return games won on grass that is over 25%. Could anyone name him? Is it a current active player? Active player. Pause at is, home if you want to have a think about it. Is it? Let me think. How, how many? Just for a little bit of a clue, James, so we get a bit of a sense. What? What's the kind of spread they've kept this high level? Is this like a relatively new player, or is this someone who's kind of been nope. around the tour for? Yeah, I would say someone like K Nishikori. Then uh, it's not K Nishikori. Is it Chilich? It's not Chilich. If if it was Chile, she'd basically have won Wimbledon about eight times, wouldn't he? <laughs> yeah, I'm, t- I'm I'm going on the basis of players who've won a lot of grass court matches uh, in the last ten years. Mm, I wouldn't. I mean, you wouldn't think of this guy as a grass court player, but I'll give you a clue that'll probably give it away. He's got to win a lot of return games. That's why I was thinking this call. <laughs> yeah, you were in the right ballpark there. Is it, is it Schwartzman? It is Diego yeah, Schwartzman. Uh, Schwartz. Yeah. Then the, the next two on that list are Dennis Kudler at 23.9% and Roberto Bautista Agut at 23.8%. Oh, Bautista Agut was going to be my next guess. Bautista Agut is like sort of sneakily quite good on grass. I always think, I feel like he always picks up a result or two in the weeks before Wimbledon that make you go, oh, ah, you know, he could, he could maybe be quite an awkward draw at some point. And then I think he's got to one semi final at Wimbledon and that's about it. But, you know. Semi, is it Wimbledon? Yeah, That's he got there good. in 2019. Oh, word. Yeah. Who's that? Roberto That's Bautista Agut. I don't remember wow. that at all. Who did he, he play in that? <laughs> uh, he played Guido Pella in the quarterfinals and then lost to Djokovic in four sets. Oh, that was the year Pella took um, Chilich out in the mm. second round, wasn't it? I have yeah. to say that Bautista Agut's draw was quite nice. There's not there's not many blokes here who I'm like, oh, they love grass. Uh, Peter Gajocic, Steve Darcy... Karen Hatchinoff, Benoit Pair, 
and then Guido Pella. Again, yeah, Benoit pair in the fourth round of a slam. You know you've lucked out, don't you? <laughs> look, look, George, you've got to win them. That's, that's all that matters. You've got to win them. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, that was the year when the semi final lineup was Novak Djokovic, Roger Federer, Rafa Nadal, and Roberto Bautista Agut. That's probably why I don't remember the Djokovic match because I was too busy focusing on that other semi. Nadal Federer, yeah, pro- probably drew your attention just a little bit. Um, anyway, let's move on since we've been distracted enough by serve and volley. Uh, Serena Williams has announced that she's going to play Toronto as her warm up for the US Open. I think, to be honest, I'm quite surprised. Am I surprised? Are we surprised, George? She's playing. Yeah. That? No, I don't think so. I think she'll probably have said she did need a little bit more of a um, match practice than the no match practice. So that that's an encouraging sign, I suppose. Because well, she's the thing is, she's also signed up to the City Open in Washington. Yeah. I don't. I mean. She she often plays a sort of semi busy summer, but I'm just quite surprised that she's potentially going to play three tournaments in a space of six weeks. Because let's face it, she's not in the best shape of her life, and she certainly didn't look particularly fit on the grass. I mean, maybe maybe that's the point. If you're not fit, you've got to play more tournaments. Yeah, I think it's well. I guess there's two sides of it. I mean, it's good news in the sense she's clearly taken the U.S. Open seriously enough to have recognised. God, I need to get some matches in. I can't just turn up and do it. Mm. That's good. The flip side is it can be quite hard to just turn up and start playing matches again when you've really not been playing, and that could then be an injury risk that sees her out of the US Open if, if something goes wrong. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know. I, I haven't seen any Instagram videos of her kind of showing massive training blocks in Wimbledon or anything. So I don't know if there's a big push or whatever, but hopefully, you know, it's only good news if Serena Williams is back, focused, wanting to try and impress at a Grand Slam rather than just turning up for the sake of it. You know, I'm, mm. I'm sure she always comes in with, well, she says she always comes in with a mindset of, I could win this thing for whatever, but after losing to Harmony Tan in the first round of Wimbledon, I'd like to think she might have reviewed that. So I'm quite pleased to see her in a few tournaments in the run-up. Is there anything, Calvin, to say that Serena Williams has never relied on like physical fitness and endurance to to win tennis matches and that actually a bit of a tune-up is all that she needs rather than any sort of you know gruelling fitness camp? No, I wouldn't say that. She's... I mean, she hits the ball way harder than anybody else, hmm. or she she did in her prime. I don't know whether she still does, um, but she was also being athletic, and she's she's always been a good mover. She's always been fast, and that kind of does the two things that people don't give her enough credit for is how how great an athlete she is, and also how good her touch is as well. She's she probably had one of the best drop shots in the women's game for some time. Um, as well, but I I wouldn't agree with that saying she doesn't need to be physically there. I think that's been a problem the last last few tournaments that she's played over the last two years. She just looks out of shape. Yeah, I think and I think there's a bit of a danger with a recency bias in that sort of sentiment because realistically, for the last f- since the pregnancy and coming back, you know, you've heard more Toglu talk about this, the commitments not being what it was before, and that's like totally fair enough. That's not necessarily a, a big criticism. It's just that your priorities change when you become a parent and you know she was clearly very committed to that and he would say you know she's still good enough to win a slam but it's not been the same as it was before that when she was absolutely relentless and you know when she was at a pump there was probably no one out there working harder because she turned up week in week out and was destroying people and she was ready for slams and she played great matches and always be, as Calvin says, physically brilliant. You know, even against Harmony Tan, some of the running forward was really good. I mean, you can still tell she's an incredible athlete. What had dropped off was the side-to-side movement, the recovery from the return and going that way. And that that's really what let her down in that match. And we, we I, you know, we spoke about it a little bit when she was playing the doubles with Oz Jabour in the early on. That, that was where the rust came. And, you know, that probably is harder to get back than a kind of straightforward line run but but she's still quick uh in that kind of linear run so yeah i i hope this is a positive thing but again it never gets easier when you get older and if you lose that fitness 
and I don't mean she's not fit. I mean match fitness, match mm. sharpness. It is hard to pull it back. I guess as well. I mean, it's it's now a question. We don't know the answer to this. It's not whether she isn't fit enough to do the side to side stuff. It's whether that's just not in her like ability anymore. She can't yeah. get to that fitness. It's not whether she hasn't trained to get to that fitness. It's maybe this is all Serena's got left in the tank. And actually, there's no point in doing that training block because she'll break down injured. So she's now got to try and win. You know, playing this this style of game, just like almost like late stage Roger Federer, like hyper hyper aggressive. But I guess when you're Serena and, and Calvin is, I'm certain, I'm sure, right that we did always underrate her speed and her athleticism. I don't know where she's got to go. Like she can't hit it harder. Yeah, and look, the the other factor that can't be underestimated as well is the the fear factor is totally gone. Honestly, mm. like players will not turn up. I mean, some players will. But the majority of top 20, 30 players will turn up and think, I should win this match now. Like, there's no two ways about it. They'll have watched that match with Harmony Tan. Tan got to the fourth round, proved me wrong. I thought she'd lose the next round after. I didn't think she had anything near enough to kind of trouble kind of top 50 players. Um, But that that was a poor result, really, in, in the grand scheme of things. You know, that's a player who didn't have much behind her shots. She wasn't moving around as much as she, well, she was moving around more than she should have been able to with the weapons she had, you know, prime Serena wins that six love six one. And I don't even think that's an exaggeration. Hmm. We shall see, I suppose. One of the great things about talking about sport is eventually you do get an answer. I'm um, had to win the US Open now. I've said that. <laughs> <laughs> at one point I did turn to someone at Wimbledon and say, Harmony Tan and Nick Kyrgios are going to win Wimbledon. And I was very nearly half right, in fairness. <laughs> it didn't quite work out that way. Um, very finally, I said we were going to talk about uh, t- tennis umpires and a terrific long read uh, from The Guardian this week uh, called You Can't Be the Player's Friend Inside the Secret World of Tennis Umpires um, by William Rolston. I listened to it on the way to work this morning and then I read it because I enjoyed it that much. Uh, so I've inhaled it twice it is well worth, and I will put the link in the show notes, going and having a look or a listen. Um, George, you've obviously been kind of trying to familiarise yourself with it as well because it is quite lengthy, and I appreciate that. <laughs> well, I was going to say you have a real job, but you don't really. So, um, it, It's fascinating to hear these guys talk about their job because, well, for a long time they weren't allowed to, and actually ordinarily they're still not allowed to, but um, William Rolston obviously given kind of special permission to interview almost all of them and mostly over breakfast as far as I can tell. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, you're right, you don't hear from them very often. And there was kind of references to uh, the umpire who was, whose name is now escaping me, who was Wimbledon final chair, who then got sacked, basically, for giving an authorised interview back in Argentina. Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, the, the thing that probably stuck out to me most, because lots of it I was kind of reading like, okay, I've seen a lot of this stuff happening. We've spoken a little bit about the relationship between players and officials and is it getting worse? You know, I think we've covered that dynamic before, but there was some stuff about kind of, again, that touches on to what we've spoken about with Simon Briggs when he came on the show and spoke a little bit about kind of the other side, the controlling nature of umpires, uh, that Soren Freeman and kind of suspension he'd had. But kind of in the middle, it was just like some of the, the scoring systems that they kind of grade umpires on, I just found really interesting. Like, so there's a bit where she chat, who is also obviously a umpire to Wimbledon final before as well. And she's grading an umpire and scored them for like five out of seven. And it, it just says in the notes that, you know, to have scored higher, she'd have needed to have responded to a difficult situation, but nothing came up in the match. Mm. And that rising umpires are being evaluated are basically desperate for really bad things to happen in their matches so they can prove they can handle difficulty, which is just like quite interesting. I think. It's weird, isn't it? It's very weird. But then I guess, uh, you know, referees in all those sports must be the same because you, you can't prove that you can deal with a difficult situation unless you get a difficult situation. Yeah, I suppose there's no difference to going for a job interview, is it really? Where, you know, 
that's where experience comes in. You need yeah. to show you've dealt with these things and talk about your time. You did this, this, and that. Um, yeah, except they have to do it live in front yeah. of an audience and yeah. and the whole world. Yeah, I, it was absolutely fascinating um, to read the words or hear the words of you know Carlos Bernardes, um, Howard Liliani, um, Richard Hay, who who's a, a British umpire who people might have seen had the Denis Shapovalov match in Rome this year, which obviously discussed. And I thought really interesting to see his reaction um the journalist who wrote it said that he approached hay after the match he seemed rattled and asked some time alone the morning after sitting in the players restaurant he was relaxed again he told me he texted leani asking for his thoughts on how he'd handled the incident and was relieved to have been given the thumbs up i mean calvin you you obviously will know and kind of rub shoulders with lots of tennis umpires i mean are, are you allowed to have much of a relationship with them i sort of assume that you are or, or are there sort of rules against that kind of thing uh, there's no rules against it. They're, a, for want of a better phrase, they're a strange bunch. Um, <laughs> they, the players know them. You know, they know some of them. I find it. I find some of the players are quite rude to them, which I don't like. Mm. Um, what you mean, off the court or on the court? On the court, mm. I think you know. There's a bit of big timing from some of the players. Um, a couple in particular who I can think of who. Um, <laughs> I, I don't like the way that they talk to umpires. Mm. Um, but the umpires do tend to keep themselves to themselves. Um, yeah, there's not much in the way of chatting between the umpires and the players. Fraternisation, for want of a better word. Yeah, but I, I think that's not some sort of, not even an unwritten rule or anything. You know, the, the umpires just keep themselves to themselves. And mm. um, the player, you know, and if they're, you occasionally get the odd match where an umpire goes and watches another match, but. Um, they're also like the ones in the the future circuit as well. Like you know, without sounding ageist, they they tend to be a different age group to the mm. players. So, well, I mean that's true. That's that's in- inevitably true yeah. at all levels because it takes a long time and a lot of hard work to get to like gold yeah. gold badge level, to, which is obviously what you need to to umpire at the last stage of the Grand Slams. There are only thirty two of them in the entire world. Um, that apparently the joke goes around that it's easier to become an astronaut than a top level tennis umpire. Um, I would say the stakes are a little higher, but <laughs> I tell you what, the umpires look a lot younger now than they did in that bloody McEnroe film. I couldn't believe <laughs> how old all like the Wimbledon umpires look back in the day. But I don't well, know this what is this want. is something that they sort of talk about in in the the piece is how umpires used to be told to say absolutely nothing. You know, if a player started talking back to them, the only thing they would pretty much say would be like you know, code violation, or in the days before code violations, just basically not talk to them at all. Whereas now it's kind of their job to, I think Carlos Bernardes says, uh, our job is to be a fireman, to put the water on the fire. When you have a situation that's very heated, you need to try to calm down, Calvin. There's, I don't know whether anyone saw it, but there was a great interaction between an umpire and, and Stuart Broad, the cricketer, last week. I don't know whether um, basically Stuart Broad was... For want of a better word, was being an ass, and the umpire gave him a bit of a bollocking. He told him to get on with the match and stop being an ass. And and you know it was quite funny, and I quite find it quite refreshing. I'd quite see tennis umpires doing that, to be honest. There was that classic Klassenberg one as well, wasn't it? Where he was like, "Oh, you used to be really nice before you started playing for England, didn't he?" Yeah, was, was it to Grealish? Is that why you remember it? It wasn't Grealish. No, oh no, you know who it was? It was James Ward Prowse. James Ward Prowse, wasn't it? Which yeah. is funny because James Ward Prowse has never been nice. Yeah. He's always and, been an absolute shit house and hasn't played that much for England. <laughs> <laughs> the um, yeah, the relationship is quite interesting there because there's a bit where Liani's kind of talking about how you know all the top. Twenty players know him and come and say hello, and they have quite like a call. I mean, it, the the focus on Leone is quite interesting, isn't it? Because it, it's all about him being like a really natural performer, and he he's got a bit of a reputation on kind of Twitter as like, oh, it's Mo's match, and you know he speaks really loudly into the umpire and almost deafens the crowd at different points. It, I just I, fa- I just found that quite interesting. That Bernardes is like walking around and people are coming up to him like, oh, you're a referee, you're a referee. It's so exciting. And, you know, that, that must have changed really significantly over the last 20 years with social media and stuff, I guess. Yeah, and TV, just like everything being on TV, every umpire being mic'd up. And I, I, I guess they've always been a focus, like even going back to McEnroe, but those umpire-player interactions are, are really in focus as well. Like I, just 
sorry, James. I think one of the problems is where, like, and I know this from from players and that that they grade, they sort of rate umpires on on their experience with them, mm-hmm. and their experience tends to always be, did they call the balls how they wanted them to be called? Yeah. And so you get these situations where players will think a certain umpire is rubbish just because they thought a ball was in, <laughs> and the ball and the umpire called it out, and the umpire can only do what what the how they see the shot. That's the yeah. thing. Um, I, I had this sort of similar conversation with Liam Brody at Wimbledon because there was one point in his uh, in one of his matches where I was a ball basically hit the baseline on his toes, and um, he left it and it was called in. And I'm convinced that the, a load of the crowd around me, because I was on number one court where the press seats are basically in line with the baseline, a load of the crowd around me started saying out. And I was convinced that, that Broads had only challenged it because he heard the crowd say it. So I asked him afterwards. He said, no, 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 I genuinely thought that was out. And I said, but it was plumb on the line. He's like, yeah, I genuinely thought that was out. And Liam Brody has like, the th- he had the third worst challenge percentage of anyone at the whole tournament. Um, I don't know if you'd like to guess who the two worst were. At Wimbledon? Yeah. Murray. Murray uh, and? Murray's by far the worst. Normally. Murray's awful. I don't think he got one right. Federer's pretty bad, but obviously he wasn't there. Kyrgios? Nick Kyrgios. Yeah. Like under I, 20%. There were a well, Kyrgios times. just then just says that Hawkeye's wrong. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just, but what was funny is Broads then went on to say, he was like, yeah, I'm going to have to think about this next time. I'm like screaming at a challenger on par for getting a line call wrong that actually maybe I'm wrong. But it's true. Like players get it wrong a lot. Yeah, definitely. There, I mean, there was a cracking example of players after them of a terrible umpire call this week, wasn't there? With that match point where, I mean, that that was a staggering. Joe, you'll probably be better at describing it than me, but it was. Well, so um, I was going to mention the, the various title winners we've had this week, because uh, although this is a bit of a dead spot on the tennis calendar, there are a load of tournaments. Um, Francisco, Cherundolo, Francisco Cherundolo, uh won the Swedish Open in Bastad, one of the stads of which there are many in the next couple of weeks, because it's Gustad next week as well. He beat Sebastian Baez in the final, 7-6-6-2. But the match point should not have counted. Um, Baez flew a ball long, and Cherundolo collapsed to his back and sort of chucked his racket a short distance. But the ball actually hit the racket before it bounced out, and therefore, of course, should have been Baez's uh, point. I mean, he won the second set 6-2, so it was probably never going to make much of a difference. But Calvin, I don't know if you've ever seen anything like that happen. No, I've not. Um, <laughs> yeah, I doubt it ever has happened before. It's pretty funny. Um, it's objectively yeah. funny. Yeah, and did Bias say anything? What I don't he... think anyone did, no. I don't think he oh. noticed. I mean, it's one of those, they're probably mates, and it's, you know, no, if it's something like that and the ball was flying a mile out, mm. you're probably, um, I mean, I played a match once. I mean, this probably says more about me than anything else. I played a match against a mate, and... I hit a ball that was going out and he couldn't get out of the way and it hit his foot and I still claim the point. <laughs> but, um, I've done it before as well, Calvin. Yeah. We're, we're, yeah. we're not alone there. You're just standing yeah. on the baseline shouting, touch. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I mean, imagine if, if it had been the other way around and that they had seen it and he goes on to throw away that 5-2 lead. Be one of it the all-time great that chokes. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, I should also mention some champions on the WTA Tour uh, this week. Uh, Petra Martic beating Olga Danilovic to win the Swiss Open in Lausanne. Uh, and Bernarda Pera uh, beating the up-and-coming Serbian Alexander Krunic to win the title in Budapest. Uh, all on clay on the WTA. Um, on the ATP, I suppose they were on clay as well, off the top of my head. No, of course. Apart the, from Newport. Apart from Newport, which of course... We talked about um, the tour moves on, although not in terms of surface. The women go to Hamburg and Palermo next week. The men also go to Hamburg, where the men men's prize money is eight times more in the men's tournament than the women's tournament. I know the men's tournaments are 500, the women's tournaments are 250, but that doesn't seem quite right. I'm going to reserve full judgment until I see the start lists for the two tournaments, uh, but I don't expect to be sated in my desire for things to be fair. Um, there's also a 250 in Gestad. In what might be the worst week of the tennis year, I'm not sure what you guys think. It's close. There's a weird bit of February that's often quite rubbish. 
when yeah. you've got like a bit of European indoor and a bit of like Middle Eastern nonsense that no one really cares about, but they go for the big appearance fee. You basically get a couple of quite dodgy weeks after every slam, to be honest, hmm. that are all just a bit nah. I actually think I probably prefer February's ones slightly. I think you've got a bit more going on there with kind of Rotterdam and Marseille that are, you know, not, not completely terrible, but hmm. Yeah, this is this is a pretty ropey part of the season, to be honest. Um, very quickly, Calvin, I, I wanted to ask you um, about. Well, it's going to be painful because it involves Henry losing a final, which is never something you want to talk about. But he did get to the final of Roehampton, and I believe he's up to a career high singles ranking. So every cloud. Um, but he lost to I think I'm right in saying Toby Samuel in the final, who was a wild card in the tournament, who had won his way into the tournament through something called the Progress Tour, which um, people talk about wildcards a lot, but it seems like the LTA have built a bit of a system of like pyramid wildcards, basically, where people can win their way into tournaments. I mean, is that is that fair to say? Um, I don't know if he's... <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Just sounds like qualifying, that, James. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, quite. I, I don't know if it's a pyramid. Uh, basically, there's... You've got the Progress Tour, the Pro League, and the British Tour Premier Tier. And as far as I know, I think if you win any of those, then you get a wild card into a 25k at some stage in Britain. Um, they're different sort of types of tournament. The British Tour is run by the LTA. Pro League is run by an independent company, um, which started during um, the first lockdown. It was mm. the first live sport that was going on in Britain um during the lockdown um and the progress tour is run by uh, Barry Fulcher um and he started that a good few years ago um and it's the seedings on that are based on universal tennis rating which is different mm. from everything else it's not based on world ranking or LTA rating it's all on universal tennis rating Mm. Um, but it seems to me at least that and some people will say this hasn't always been the case in British tennis that it's, it seems at least much more meritocratic than maybe it once was and, and certainly British players playing a lot more competitive tennis yeah that's the that's the main thing I, the wildcard stuff I you know largely I couldn't care less about because I, I think that nobody ever deserves a wild card. if you get one you're lucky to get one Mm. Um, but the main thing is that people are the one thing that I always wanted was plenty. There was a lot of high level tennis going on and money to be made for the players. If you're not going to fund players, which is fine, then at least give them the opportunities to earn their own money. And that's the main thing that the Progress Tour uh, and the Pro League and the British Tour and the LTA bonus scheme has allowed players to do. Just, just for a quick finisher, can you name the current top ten men in the Universal Tennis rankings right now? Well, um, I assume Djokovic is one. He's not. He's number two. Medvedev he? one. He's not. Nadal will be one. Nadal one. Nadal, obviously. Three. Um, Alcaraz. I, mean, I would assume Alcaraz. Three Alcaraz, yeah. Four. Uh, he's had a good year. Medvedev it... must be four, is he? Yeah. Medvedev's, Medvedev's four. Five. Oh, this is getting... Zverev? Zverev, yep. Yeah. Is City Pass way down on this? He he's actually six. Right. I was going to say because the, the top six you kind of quite similar to the actual <sighs> six, mm. but it's quite interesting. Seven to ten. Tell us seven through ten, George, quickly. Seven, Nick Kyrgios. Eight, <laughs> Taylor Fritz. Nine, Gael Monfils. And ten, right. Yannick Sinner. Wow. I mean, Gael Monfils has. I mean, he is now injured again, unfortunately, but he has had a sneakily good year. Um, Kyrgios, that's, that's that's the thing with the pro league though uh, with the utr though is that you it basically tells you who the best players are because no there's no seat you can't work the system on that because nobody knows what the algorithm is they have their right. own algorithm and nobody knows what it is it's based something on it's not based at all so as, as people know the rankings are based on how far you get in a tournament the utr isn't based at all on that it's based entirely on the players that you beat and the scores that you beat them by mm. That's very interesting. Um, we could talk about it a lot more. Maybe we will one day because someone will certainly want to come and talk to us about it. Um, but in case people get worried hearing about Gael Monfils, I don't know how injured he is, but he's not playing Hamburg or Kitzbühel, so he must be a bit injured with a foot injury that he missed Wimbledon with. Um, that is all we've got time for this week. Thank you very much for listening. Please do leave us a rating and a review if you can. Make it a nice one, and please do come back next week.
Sports Social Podcast Network. Look, my day job as a firefighter is tough, but my night job as a social media manager, my Persian cat Jinxie, that's intense. It's 8 p.m. I've finally gotten home from another 24 hour shift, and I just want to kick back with a cold one, but. Old Jinxie knocks my beer right off the counter and gives me that look that says, no drinking on the clock. But Heineken Zero Zero keeps us both happy. Zero alcohol, but just as refreshing. So I get my drink and I can still work on Jinxie's new line of merch. Heineken Zero Zero. 0.0% alcohol. Now you can. Must be 21 plus to purchase. Enjoy responsibly.